Amen. Thank you for that. And thank you again for being here this morning on Easter Sunday as we gather together and worship our risen Savior. I want you to take your Bibles this morning and open to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Happy Easter. Interestingly, this year, Easter falls on April Fool's Day. Did you notice that? April 1st, every year, is April Fool's Day. And so I want you to know this morning that I don't have any big April Fool's Day jokes for you, okay? This sermon that I'm preaching is the truth. It's not one big lie. It's not one big joke. What I'm saying today is, uh, is not anything to do with April Fool's. However, I decided that we would kind of lean into April Fool's Day and begin a series this morning entitled Foolish. And we're going to talk about how the world often views Christianity, the Word of God, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I want to kind of take a few weeks and talk about some of the most important questions that people ask about Christianity. Today, we're going to ask this question, can a dead man really live again? Can a dead man really live again? And over the next few weeks, we're going to ask questions like this, can, can one man really save everyone? How can I believe in something I can't see? Is there really only one way to God? Now, these are reasons that many people object to Christianity and reasons that many people find our faith foolish. These are questions that you may have had or questions that others might have asked you or maybe you've heard these questions posed from time to time. We're going to answer some of the hardest questions and deal with some of the biggest objections that people raise toward Christianity. And today, we're going to ask this question, can a dead man really live again? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse 18. You ready for the word? Say Amen. For the word of the cross is folly, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Remember this morning, the power is in the perfect Word of God. Would you join me as we pray? Father, would you add your blessing to the reading of your Word and now to its teaching, and thank you today that I can preach in resurrection power because Jesus is alive. And today in this place, Holy Spirit of God, we ask that you would speak to each and every person, to every individual, that you would call us to yourself for those who need to trust Christ for salvation, that you would speak and work in this place, in this time, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever done anything foolish? What's the most foolish thing you've ever done? Don't answer out loud in church or you'll be adding to your list, right? Everybody at one time or another has done something very foolish. We have all been in a situation where where we wish we could just run away and hide, or we wish we could press rewind and it didn't happen. And to be honest, you know this, some are more foolish than others, right? Somebody just got elbowed in the side. And some people do more foolish things. We've all, we've all tripped when we shouldn't have tripped. We've all said something we shouldn't have said, and we wish we could take it back. We've all done something we shouldn't have done. Can I, I have a confession this morning? Every time before I come to preach on this stage, I make sure my pants are zipped. Every time every single time because I don't want to be part of your preacher story 30 years from now I remember that day when the preacher got up no no that's not happening right I don't want to be part of that story see everybody's done something foolish before we all have I can remember when Jake was just a little baby Stephanie and I were living in North Georgia. We were church planters. We'd started a church in Forsyth County. We were meeting in a high school cafeteria at North Forsyth High School. 
And I can remember that Sunday night we had a fellowship at the park. All the church gathered together and we were hanging out. We were playing games. We were having fun. We were just fellowshipping as a church. And we'd uh, all had time to gather around and eat. And Jake was, Jake was small enough to, to still drink a little, bit of, uh, a, a little bit of formula. But still, uh, he was big enough to be able to eat, uh, to eat baby food. I can remember, pretty sure that night, the baby food was English peas. So what do you do when you're hanging out with everybody? You got a little baby. I decided to take Jake and just, just hold him in my arms for a little while and play with him. Everybody else was playing. And so what do you do with babies? Like you grab them, you hold them, and you smile at them real big, and they smile back. You hold them up in the air, and you look at them. You throw them up and catch them, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. He loved that when he was little. I can't do it as much now that he's 13. But it was, it was great. We were having a good time. And so I grabbed Jake, and I was just looking at him, holding him like this little baby, and I was like, hey, bud, and I held him up like this, big, wide-open mouth smile. I was smiling at him. He was smiling at me, and I was smiling all until just that moment he spit up right in my mouth. <laughs> baby formula, and I'm certain English peas, all right? I, I mean, and it, in that moment, right, like how do you recover from something? like In that moment, I felt like everybody in the park was going, you know, laughing at me. Because I was going, you know, trying to get it all out of my mouth. And what do you do when you have those moments of embarrassment and foolishness? We, we all have a story. We all have a story like that. But today, we're, we're beginning this series, and we're going to talk about how people view the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and Paul deals with it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He deals with the fact that in reality many people in this world believe the message of Jesus, the word of the cross, is foolishness. To them, it's not reality. It's a fairy tale. It's not the truth. It's a myth. And so Paul reminds us here, the gospel of Jesus Christ appears foolish to some people. But can I remind you this morning, the message of Christianity is countercultural. I want you to understand that. Jesus says the way to go up is down in humility. Jesus says you want to be great, you must serve. That's interesting. Now, that's not what the, the world says. Jesus says if you want to get, you've got to give. You've got to give up. The world says seeing is believing, but faith says believing is seeing. How can a man's death bring life? That's the message of Christianity. It is very countercultural. And Paul reminds us here that there are several responses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. First of all, some people stumble at the message of the gospel, it causes some to stumble. In fact, the Bible tells us right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that the gospel is the power of God. It's revealed through the Lord Jesus Christ, the story of the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. But some people cannot get past it. They believe this message is too foolish. It's too simple. It must be more complicated than that. There has to be more to it. In fact, the Bible says here in verse 23, Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. Notice what he says, a stumbling block to Jews. Why did the Jews stumble at this message? They stumbled at this message because it was too simple. In fact, the Bible tells us in verse 22, Jews demand signs. They were looking for something spectacular. You know what the Jews wanted? They wanted a Messiah to come, and they didn't want a Messiah who would suffer. They wanted a Messiah who would come and establish his rule, defeat Rome, and establish his kingdom on the earth, and the Jews would reign with him. Now, the, the Jews demanded a sign. They wanted some spectacular show. They, their emphasis was on miracles. In fact, when they followed Jesus around, they constantly demanded that Jesus show them some type of sign. But he wasn't there just to perform a magic trick to prove who he was. In fact, if you know the story of the Jews out of the exodus of Egypt and following the pillar of the cloud by, by day and the pillar of fire by night and all the miracles of the crossing of the Red Sea, they demanded some type of spectacular sign. They were looking for great glory. When it came to the cross, they stumbled at the weakness of the cross. How could anybody put faith in an unemployed carpenter from Nazareth crucified on a cross. That's foolishness. How could anyone trust in Mary's son? 
It's foolishness. And to them, they were, they were looking for something spectacular. They, they thought that this king would come and establish a kingdom. But the Bible tells us the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation. It is not weakness, it is might. Rather than a testimony of weakness, the cross is a tremendous instrument of power. After all, here he says, the weakness of God in the message of the gospel is stronger than men. Some people look at the message of the gospel that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he stayed in a tomb for three days, that he rose again after three days and now lives to save and to redeem those who place their faith in him. Some people believe that is utter foolishness. It simply doesn't make sense. But I want to remind you of something very important this morning. You, you cannot be strong enough to get to heaven doesn't matter how many mountains you climb or how many marathons you run or how many weights you lift. You will never be strong enough to make it. You can't be smart enough to get to heaven. doesn't matter how many degrees you get or how many classes you take or what kind of grades you make. You can't be smart enough to make it on your own. You can't be good enough to get to heaven. doesn't matter how many times you come to Easter Sunday service or whether you're at church every time the doors are open or how many good works or how much money you give, that doesn't get you to heaven. You see, we begin to think about the cross and the message of the gospel and the word of God in terms of our human understanding and we think there's something we ought to be able to do to make this work. It's pretty hard for us to get. Listen to me carefully. Coming to Christ is not some grand poetic gesture on our part. Do you know what it is? It is simply coming to the cross, confessing our sin, bowing in humility, and trusting in Jesus. That's it. And to the world that doesn't know Christ and doesn't believe the Bible, that is a message of foolishness. Some stumble at the message of the gospel. Secondly, some scoff at the message of the gospel. Other people reject the gospel because to them it's simple and it's foolish. And they laugh and they scoff at the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. To them, all this church stuff is simply foolishness. This was one of the response of the Greeks. In fact, Paul's dealing with a, a few groups of people. He's dealing with the Jews and he's dealing with the Greeks. Two main groups. The Jews were looking for that strength and power, that sign. The Greeks, you know what they emphasized. If you know your history, the Greeks emphasized human philosophy, wisdom, and understanding. And so to the Greeks, this message was simply, it, it was too simple. It wasn't profound enough. They emphasized wisdom. They wanted to study all the great philosophers, and they saw no wisdom in the cross. Look what the Bible says in verse 20. Paul addresses this. Where's the one who is wise? He addresses three people. Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Paul calls out three types of people. The wise. He's calling out those who are the, who are the experts of the day. And then he calls out, where, where are the scribes, the interpreters of the writings? Where's the debater, the disputer, those that are, that are trained to argue in human philosophy and wisdom? Where are all those people? And then what he says is this, God has destroyed their wisdom. In other words, human philosophy doesn't get you to heaven. They laugh and they mock. One question that Paul has for them is, through all of your studies and through all of your human understanding, has it brought you closer to God? Can it bring you to heaven? And the answer is, absolutely not. It can't. This is why he says, the wisdom of God. It stands in complete opposition to the wisdom and the understanding of man. Look, look what the Bible says in verse 19. It is written, he quotes Isaiah, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. So Paul says, Greeks seek wisdom. But the foolishness of God is wiser than man. Verse 21, the Bible says, the world did not know God through wisdom. Human philosophy will not take you to heaven. You, you may be smart, you may rely on your own wisdom and understanding, but you can't make it to heaven by your own wisdom. It just doesn't work that way. And some people laugh. 
It was strange to me how the world relies on human philosophy, wisdom, science, and understanding. At one point in our history, the vast majority of the smartest people in the world believed the earth was flat. You remember that? They really thought that Columbus was going to sail right off the edge of the map. And then at another point in our history, the vast majority of the smartest people in the world believed that the sun revolved around the earth, that it was a geocentric instead of heliocentric universe. And then, as we know, the earth and our system revolves around the sun. And then when I was growing up, and most likely when you were growing up, we were taught Pluto is a planet. And now, they're trying to tell us that it's not. That is messed up. That's all I got to say. I don't understand. All of these things, right, human wisdom and philosophy, it changes. It's not consistent, but I want you to understand. This book, this word of God, it is consistent. It is constant. It is the wisdom of God expresses the way of salvation, and it never changes stays the same. It's consistent. The wisdom of this world constantly changes. And some laugh and scoff at the message of the gospel. But then I want you to notice something very important. Number three, some are saved by the power of the gospel. You see three groups of people. Some stumble, some scoff and laugh. But then some believe. They repent and they come to the cross and they are saved by the power of the gospel. To some, it is weakness. To others, it is foolishness. But to those who repent and believe, it is power and wisdom. That's what Paul says. That's the whole point. Paul didn't alter his message when he turns to a Jewish audience or when he turns to a Greek audience. Notice what he says in verse 21. For since the wisdom of this age, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach, through the foolishness of what we preach, to save those who believe. Now your translation may say the foolishness of preaching. Paul does not mean to say that preaching in itself is foolishness. He means to say that the content, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ appears to be foolish to those that don't know the Lord. And he says it pleased the Lord to save those who believe through what other people might say is weak and foolish. The content of the message. So this is not the Christ of the manger. This is not the Christ of the temple. This is not the Christ of the marketplace. This is the Christ on the cross and the Christ of the empty tomb. He says to many, it's foolishness. Listen to me carefully, and I want you to understand what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is not just a question of strength versus weakness. This is not just a question of wisdom versus foolishness. This is a question of life versus death. This is eternity. This is heaven and hell. What does he say in verse 23 and verse 24? For Jews, 23, we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greece, Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Notice what he says. This is a question of life and death to some they stumble. To others, they laugh. But to those who know Christ, it is both the power and the wisdom of God. Paul says, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Billy Graham once said, if I were an enemy of Christianity, I would aim right at the resurrection because that is the heart of Christianity. British philosopher E.M. E. M. Jode was once asked, if you could get a truthful answer to one question, what would your question be? He didn't hesitate. He said, I would want to know the answer to this question. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Because if he did, that changes everything. You see, to say that Jesus died is one thing. To say that Jesus died for the sins of the world is another thing. But there are many that could come and say, I'm going to be crucified and I'm dying for the sins of the world. But Christianity begins where every other religion stops. 
every other religion has a founding father. They have a figure that they can point to and say, this is the person that we follow. This is the person that, that started everything. But every other religion, their founder is in the grave. Christianity says Jesus Christ died for our sins, yet he is alive. He rose again from the dead. That changes everything. Christianity begins where every other religion stops. You see, the difference between every other religion and following Jesus Christ is our founder is alive. We worship him today. That's what Easter is all about. I've talked to many people about Jesus. And in conversations with many people, I've talked to some who reject Jesus and Christianity on the basis of their education or philosophical reasons. It just doesn't seem possible to them. They cannot rationalize their understanding of the universe and believe in the God of the Bible. I've talked to others who say they want a sign. I'll believe in God if he writes it for me in the sky or if I have a dream or a vision or maybe a handwriting on the wall. I need to see something powerful and and majestic. Paul says, the Jews demand this, the Greeks demand this, but what does Paul do? We preach Jesus. That's what he does. Listen to me this morning. Can I tell you? The answer is Jesus. The answer is Jesus. You can't find that on a calculator or a computer or a test tube. You can't demand it to be written in the skies or proven in a vision. Can a dead man live again? Absolutely yes. Jesus Christ is alive. He was seen by hundreds after his resurrection and at his ascension. Can a dead man live again? You ask me. Absolutely he can. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart and billions of people across this world today profess that Jesus is alive. Alive. February 21st, 2018, and March 14th, 2018. Two dates, exactly three weeks apart. On both of those days, a very famous person died. On February 21st, 2018, Billy Graham passed away. You know Billy Graham, famous evangelist. Advisor to presidents, on many occasions America's conscience, faithful evangelist, telling people how to come to Jesus, preaching the foolishness of God. He saw many, many thousands place their faith in Jesus Christ. February 21st, 2018. The other date represents another death of a very famous person. On March 14th, 2018, Stephen Hawking died. Three weeks to the day after the death of Billy Graham. Most likely you've heard of this famous scientist, Stephen Hawking. He was an English theoretical physicist and a cosmologist. I didn't say cosmetologist, all right? Cosmologist. He was the director of research at the Center for Theoretical Cosmology within the University of Cambridge. That's a lot to get out. In one sentence. Here's what Hawking said. He spent his life denying the existence of God. As an avowed atheist, here's what he said. There's a fundamental difference between religion, which is based on authority, and science, which is based on observation and reason. Science will win because it works. That's what Hawking said. He also described the concept of an afterlife as a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. To Hawking... Christianity is utter foolishness. However, he spent his last years on earth warning our people, warning the globe, that within the next hundred years, our world would be invaded by a super intelligent alien species. He said that. And warning us that within the next 250 years, our world would burn up because of global warming. I pray that in his last moments of life, in his last few breaths, Stephen Hawking trusted in Christ. I pray he did. But there is absolutely no evidence to that effect. And most likely, he died denying God's existence and denying the reality of Christianity, believing and thinking it to be foolish. Can you imagine when one man died 
on February 21st, 2018, what he first saw. Well done, good and faithful servant. Can you imagine when Billy Graham walked the streets of gold and begins to see so many people who were saved under his ministry? Preaching the foolishness of God, trusting in humility and the cross of Jesus Christ, saved. And then a very different fate, March 14th, 2018. The man that spent his life claiming there is no God will one day stand before him in judgment. You see, in reality, we can stumble at the message of the gospel. We can scoff at the message of the gospel, but there are those who come to the cross and see it for what it is. The wisdom of God and the power of God unto salvation. And they are forever changed. You see, Christianity might be considered foolish by some. It might be considered weak to others. But to those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And we are forever changed. 